This is the newsroom for today, Wednesday, July 7th, 2021. We are broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN and Tarzi TV in Bartika. In the headlines, President Irfan Ali has condemned the cowardly execution of Haiti's president, saying it is a tragedy for the Caribbean. It is a cowardly act. It has no place in our region. The government has dismissed the APNU AFC's no-confidence motions against the Home Affairs and Health Ministers as political drama. Six more COVID-19 vaccination sites opened in Georgetown and in sport, huge expectation on CSC bodybuilders but financial support needed. And in tonight's feature, we share the story of a young Essequibo cricketer. With the news, I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that the Haitian president, Jovenel Moise, was shot dead by unknown gunmen in his private residence, intensifying the ongoing unrest that has been affecting the French-speaking Caribbean nation. Vishani Raghubir joins us. It has been reported that at around 1 a.m. on Wednesday, unknown gunmen opened fire on Haitian President, 53-year-old Jovenel Moise, and his wife Martine Moise in the couple's private residence in Haiti's capital city, Port-au-Prince. According to CNN, the country's acting Prime Minister Claude Joseph in a statement said that the president was mortally wounded and succumbed to his injuries. Meanwhile, the news network also reported that Haiti's ambassador to the United States, Bokit Edmond, related that the First Lady was being evacuated to a hospital in Miami for treatment. Her condition was reportedly stable but critical. It was also reported that Joseph declared that Haiti was in a state of siege, which is the second tier of emergency in Haiti. The first tier is a state of emergency, while the third and highest tier is a state of war. Under the state of siege regime, national borders are closed and martial law temporarily is imposed, with Haiti's military and national police empowered to enforce the law. The president's assassination has occurred amid extreme violence that led to the displacement of thousands of people. Part of the conflict in the country has reportedly been due to disputes over the assassinated president's right to continue serving in the presidency and his time in office. The BBC has reported that the Caribbean country is grappling with both a humanitarian and political crisis. Over the past two days, the situation of Haiti had been one of the prominent issues discussed at the 42nd regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM. On Tuesday night, hours before the Haitian president was assassinated, the incumbent chairman of CARICOM, Gaston Brown, said that the situation of escalating violence in a seemingly ungovernable Haiti was a matter of great concern. Uh, the situation in Haiti, obviously, is of grave concern to the community. Uh, heads express uh, significant concern about the escalating violence, to include the wanton killings. We understand that um, even individuals with um, disabilities and other vulnerable groups are uh, literally being you know, decimated in, um, in Haiti. Uh, we are also concerned about the fact that, you know, the country is practically um, ungovernable at this time and there needs to be some restoration of um, normalcy, uh, restoration of the rule of law. We recognize that there is a timeline for elections and um, we just hope that, um, you know, the government of Haiti will confine itself to the provisions of the CARICOM um, uh, charter, um, civil charter, to ensure that, um, you know, uh, Haiti can restore some level of normalcy and to ensure the protection of the citizens and residents in Haiti. And the CARICOM stands ready to utilize its good offices to assist in bringing some level of normalcy to the situation in Haiti. Meanwhile, on Tuesday night as well, the CARICOM chairman also highlighted that the community would continue working alongside regional and international partners to help stymie the conflict in the country. Um, CARICOM uh, has been and will continue to um, work with the international partners. Um, we have been collaborating with the OAS and will certainly continue to do so. We recognize that um, France and the U.S. in particular, that um, they have been integrally involved in the situation um, in Haiti and certainly will be collaborating with them as we seek to work together conjointly to address the issues um, in Haiti and obviously to restore Haiti to some level of normalcy. A number of world leaders have condemned the assassination of the Haitian leader and the leadership situation in the country is evolving. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Vishani Ragabir. The assassination of the president of Haiti, Jovenel Moïse, has sent shockwaves through the Caribbean region with the world over expressing outrage. 
in calling for a swift justice on Wednesday, Guyana's head of state, Dr. Irfan Ali, said a horrific act is a tragedy for both Haiti and the Caribbean. He said political assassination has no place in the contemporary Caribbean, it solves nothing nor resolves anything, and believes murderous actions are repugnant to the values of the regional integration movement and incompatible with democratic values and constitutional rule. It's a very tragic moment for the region. Uh, I condemn it in every shape and form. This definite vi violence and killing and assassination is definitely not a means to an end in resolving any issue. It is a cowardly act. It has no place in our region and uh, we condemn it totally. Facing two no-confidence motions from the APNU AFC coalition, the government on Wednesday said that it has not lost confidence in the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, and the Minister of Home Affairs, Robson Ben. The motions call into question the performance of the two ministers, but their colleagues in government have said that they continue to repose full confidence in their ability to handle the prevailing COVID-19 crisis and crime situation in the country. Kurt Campbell reports. The two no-confidence motions filed by the APNU-AFC coalition opposition against Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony and Minister of Home Affairs Robson Ben will not succeed according to Minister of Governance and Parliamentary Affairs Gil Teixeira. But even with the failure of the motions imminent given the government's one-seat majority in the House, Teixeira, who is also the chief whip in the National Assembly, has said that the government members of Parliament are prepared to defend the performance of Ben and Dr. Anthony through a parliamentary debate. On Tuesday, Opposition Leader Joseph Harmon delivered the motions to the Clerk of the National Assembly, Sherlock Isaacs. Harmon believes that the management of the COVID-19 crisis in Guyana has been woeful and that crime in all forms is on an astronomical increase in Guyana. But according to Tashira, the motions are absolute nonsense as she noted that the government has not lost confidence in any of the two ministers. Speaking with the newsroom in the corridors of Parliament buildings, Georgetown on Wednesday, the Chief Whip said that even if the Speaker of the National Assembly, Mansour Nazir, decides that the motions meet the requirements of the standing orders and are sent to the House for a debate, it will go nowhere further. She said it will definitely not see the removal of Ben and Anthony from the National Assembly as she insisted that they will continue to serve at the parliamentary level at the pleasure of the President Irfan Ali and with the support of all government MPs. Absolutely nonsensical. Well, the speak, it's in the Speaker's domain now. He has to determine whether they fulfill the standing orders and the and parliamentary practice. And if he agrees, then it goes to the House and it will be debated. Back in 2012, then opposition leader and now former President David Granger had tabled the motion of no confidence against Government Minister Clement Rohe. Although the parliamentary opposition had passed the motion using the one-seat majority it held, Rohe continued to sit in the National Assembly. With the opposition insisting on barring Rohe from participating in the business of the House, the no-confidence vote was challenged in court. The chair recalled that incident on Wednesday, reminding that it is only by using the recall legislation that a member of parliament can be removed. Although the recall legislation prevents MPs from permanently crossing the floor, it also specifies how that person can be removed as an MP. That isn't how a member is removed from the House. Well, you know, that's why the process for removing a member? <laughs> Remember the recall legislation. Right. It's only through that means. Through the president. You die, you're incapacitated, um, you're mentally unfit, or that your party no longer has confidence in you. The legislation states that only the political leader of a list of candidates that contested the general and regional elections can remove an MP after meaningful consultation at the party level. In this case, it would be the president, Dr. Irfan Ali, who can remove either Ben or Dr. Anthony. For the newsroom, Kurt Campbell. Meanwhile, President Irfan Ali on Wednesday dismissed the two no-confidence motions and noted that the one-line documents lacked effort and, as a consequence, lost their meaningfulness. Dr. Ali said his interest and focus remain on delivering on his promise and commitment to the Guyanese people. Dr. Ali posited that a filing of the motions gives the government an opportunity to once again tell the Guyanese public of what the government inherited in these two sectors and what has happened since. He spoke with the media at the sidelines of an event on Wednesday. If you are going to do something meaningful, you should put effort in it. Did you see the no confidence motion? One line. They didn't even spend any time to put any effort. It shows that this is just political drama. 
There was no thinking behind it. There's no structure behind it. There is no work behind it. It is just political drama, and I'm not interested in political drama. I'm interested in this, delivering to the people of this country. And the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of Health has been doing just that, delivering to the people of this country. There is only one no confidence, and that no confidence is in the APNU AFC record on democracy. That is the only no confidence. I'm Did sure that the two ministers would outline in great detail. This gives us an excellent opportunity to once again present to the Guyanese people what we risked or inherited when we came into office and where we are today. And mark my word, our commitment will be Okay. Two men were on Wednesday remanded to prison for the murder of 53-year-old taxi driver Kenrick Trim, whose body was dumped at the end of Cul-de-Sac Street, Block 1, Ogle, East Coast Demerara last week. Kenty Bacchus, a 34-year-old welder of Water Street, Kingston, Georgetown, and Sion James, a 25-year-old fish vendor of Lane Avenue, Georgetown, appeared before Magistrate Russia Liverpool at a Sparandam Magistrate's Court. The men were not required to plead to the charge, which alleged that on June 30, 2021, at Ogle, they murdered Trim of Belfield Housing Scheme. Magistrate Liverpool remanded the duo to prison and adjourned the matter to August 6, 2021. The court heard that on the day in question, Bacchus and James were at a snacket located at Carmichael Street when Bacchus flagged down Trim's taxi and requested to be taken to a location along the east coast of Demerara. It is alleged that while in the vicinity of Ogle, James, who was seated in the back seat, began to choke Trim and caused him to faint. It is further alleged that the duo stabbed Trim several times about the body and relieved him of his cellular phone and gold jewelry. Trim was found lying motionless in the grass at the end of Cul-de-Sac Street. When the news returns, six more COVID-19 vaccination sites open in Georgetown and CARICOM supports member states imposing visa requirements to curb the smuggling of Haitians. This is the newsroom. Six more vaccination sites have opened in Georgetown and the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, is encouraging more people, especially the younger ones, to get vaccinated. Last week we had training for many of the workers at these sites. And so as of yesterday, we have added an additional six sites in Georgetown. And by the end of the week, we are hoping to add another four sites. So this would um, increase to about 10 sites in Georgetown. And hopefully uh, persons who have not been vaccinated as yet will take the opportunity to get their vaccines. The low age group, because we started um, later, uh, we have seen uptake in this age group, but it's not as much as we would want it to be. And therefore, we are encouraging persons to uh, come out and make sure that they get their vaccines. The, the challenge that we have there is that the younger age group, while most of them um, we have seen would have gotten, if they get infected, they would probably get a milder form of the infection. That is now changing because in the hospital now we are seeing relatively younger persons who are coming into the hospital. We have, for example, uh, persons in their thirties and so forth who are in the hospital. And most of these persons remain unvaccinated. So what people might think that if you're younger, you don't need to be vaccinated, that's not true. Because if you're not vaccinated, you're putting yourself at risk. And there is a percentage of persons who would get the severe form of the disease. And so to prevent that, the better thing is to make sure that you get vaccinated so as to prevent the severe form of the disease and to even prevent deaths. As concerns mount relating to the smuggling of Haitian nationals in Guyana, Chairman of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, says that despite having the right to move, steps have been taken by countries to protect their integrity. The chairman said this on Tuesday night while answering questions from a Guyanese journalist at a press conference held at the end of a two-day 42nd regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Governments of CARICOM. Vishani Raghubir tells us more. 
On Tuesday night, Chairman of the Caribbean Community CARICOM, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda Gaston Brown, said that even though Haitian nationals have the right to move freely on their CARICOM, there are instances where the free move is not necessarily in keeping with the uh, treaty requirements. But we have to be pragmatic about these things. I mean, a country like Sink, it's uh, Nevis, for example. If um, Sink, it's Nevis, um, were to get, let's say, 50,000 of the um, the 11 million Haitians, then clearly, you know, they'll become overwhelmed almost overnight and um, their social services and so on will be strained. So countries have had to, you know, put systems in place to, to curb that type of situation, especially, you know, those who may have entered um, these countries uh, without going through the proper, um, you know, protocols. In fact, um, there are many of them who have been told that may have been smuggled into various countries within the region. And, um, you know, it's one thing to have the right to move, but um, if you do not um, follow the administrative um, arrangements and the legal arrangements and you uh, smuggle into the country, then, you know, evidently steps up have to be taken to protect the integrity of the receiving state. Many CARICOM countries, including Guyana, have imposed restrictions on Haitian nationals. In Guyana, the reinstituting of the visa requirements for Haitian nationals was recently done due to the illegal departure of thousands of Haitian nationals. In fact, between 2015 and 2021, a total of 42,100 Haitian nationals are recorded to have arrived in Guyana, according to figures confirmed by the newsroom. But of that number, only 3,913 persons were recorded to have departed. CARICOM Secretary General Erwin LaRocque also stated that CARICOM's revised Treaty of Chagaramas provides some exceptions to free movement on the basis of public health and morals. Importantly, he said that there seems to be a worrying situation where Haitian nationals are being taken advantage of. That under normal circumstances, as Prime Minister has mentioned, Haitian nationals um, would have um, free access um, uh, to enter um, like any other CARICOM nationals, but there has been, um, as has been evident in a number of member states, and it's a very worrying situation. Uh, it's something that we had actually raised with the um, Haitian government themselves, but there, there seem to be persons who are taking advantage of the Haitian nationals and, and um, sometimes entering legally, but exiting illegally. And that in itself, um, is not in conformity with the with the laws, so I will say that um, it is a it is a very very concerning issue, um, which which continues to occupy our mind in terms of how do we address this because it's it, it's a problem. It was only last week that some 50 starving and abandoned Haitian nationals were rescued by law enforcement officials after they were found wandering along the Linden to Letem Trail in desperate need of food and water. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Vishani Raghavir. Though a shortfall in production was experienced, the Ghana Sugar Cooperation for the first half of 2021 surpassed its target for the sale of sugar and molasses by $734 million. Making this revelation was the Chief Executive Officer, Sais Narain Singh, who on Tuesday attributed the increase in revenue to the change in the cooperation's sales mix. Shikima Day reports. In a bid to make itself more self-sufficient and sustainable, Kaisuku had moved away from the sale of bulk sugar and invested heavily in the packaged product, which is in greater demand and carries a higher cost on the market. That strategy in turn bore fruit, and according to the CEO Sis Narain Singh, the cooperation's primary focus now is packaged sugar for the top shelf. We produce less sugar, but we made more money. And this is the credit for this has to go to His Excellency the President. At our very first meeting as an executive team with him, he planted a seed in our, in our domain to say, change the sales mix. We went back to the drawing table, we evaluated our options, we changed the sales mix in accordance with what he instructed, and the results are resoundingly successful. We've sold 12,000 metric tons less sugar and we've made $738 million more in revenue. That is a fantastic um, feat accomplished in the sugar industry. Um, and let me, let, me, let me make this very, very clear. Guyana has enough sugar to produce and supply both Guyana and the Caribbean market. And that's where we make our money. 
Now, with the new cash inflow, Singh revealed that the corporation has begun paying off trade creditors over the last six months. So we've redirected all of the funds to repaying our urgent, um, the urgent credit uh, debtors. People, you know, the people that we owe our trade creditors, we have paid down some seven hundred million dollars over the last six months to people who offer critical parts to our fields and factory. Um, so let me give you an example. All of our, um, our fertilizers have been paid for, all, for 2021. All of our agrochemicals we've paid for so far, that is in the system for 2021. All of the, the PPEs, meaning the personal protection for the employees, have been paid for. Notwithstanding this, the cooperation is still taking a hit after many of its crops are inundated by flood waters. But according to the CEO, Gaisuku is still optimistic about the outlook of the industry. A new target of more than 49,000 metric tons of sugar has been set, but that number may change after a detailed flood assessment is conducted to determine just how much has been lost. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Shakima Day. The Minister of Governance and Parliamentary Affairs, Gail Teixeira, on Wednesday expressed cautious optimism at the restart of meetings of the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee under the chairmanship of the opposition parliamentarian, German Faguera. The committee is tasked with examining the country's audited accounts as presented in the Auditor General's report. The PAC has not met for several months as the government members of parliament on the committee opposed the chairmanship of David Patterson. With Patterson removed, Teixeira, who was seen caucusing with Faguera on Wednesday in the corridors of Parliament buildings, said she welcomes the new chairmanship. I think we have some possibilities. I'm looking forward to it. As a young man, I hope that um, I think we can have a good work, work working relationship, and I think that would be important for the PAC and for the future. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Meanwhile, President Irfan Ali has reaffirmed the government's commitment in ensuring that Ghana's indigenous people are part and parcel of the country's mainstream development. As such, the President on Wednesday handed over 30 tractors with trailers to indigenous communities in regions 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 and 9 to aid farmers in their agricultural endeavors. Shakima Day has more. The President, Dr. Irfan Ali, on Wednesday said that his government is committed to working with indigenous communities in the hinterland regions to ensure sustainable development and livelihood, and more importantly, to ensure that they are a part of the mainstream development of Guyana. His comments were made at the handing over ceremony of 30 tractors and trailers to indigenous communities in regions 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 and 9, a campaign promise that has now been fulfilled. The handing over ceremony was held at the Hinterland Scholarship Dormitory at Liliendal. And we are not going to spare any expenditure to ensure that we deliver to you better and higher quality education, but more importantly, give you and your communities the access to educational services that is so critically needed in the transformation agenda. It is also important for us to equip you with what is necessary to sustain your livelihood, to improve community services, and to advance your productive capacity. In advancing your productive capacity, you need the equipment, you need the tools, you need the technology, you need the knowledge, you need a technical support so that we can move to different forms of agriculture, so that we can move to high value, sustainable crops, whilst at the same time supporting the community economy. According to the President, that achievement is not only centered on the provision of goods and services, but also the transformation of Guyana's human resources. Hence, the President said that government's drive for education is also a critical pathway for the advancement of indigenous communities. I am pleased to be participating in this ceremony, which attests to our commitment to hinterland food security and to the generation of economic livelihood for hinterland communities. 
Further, President Ali outlined that the government will continue to develop strategies, plans and projects that speak directly to the needs of various communities. He was keen to note that those plans will be developed not by the subject ministries, but in the communities that will directly benefit from the investments. Reporting for the newsroom, Shakim Day. CARICOM is considering reducing the cost of airfare with a travel bubble and the Agriculture Ministry signs $340 million in contracts. This is the newsroom. Heads of government of the Caribbean community CARICOM are expected to consider proposals next week for the reduction of taxes for intra-regional travel and the establishment of a travel bubble replete with COVID-19 safety protocols to resuscitate the regional tourism industry. This was highlighted by the incumbent chairman of CARICOM, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, during a press conference on Tuesday night. We recognize the need to reopen economies while balancing the health and economic livelihood of community nationals and agreed that new protocols for health, safety, visitor management and sanitation measures were of utmost importance in encouraging the resuscitation of the tourism sector. We agreed to consider proposals to reduce taxes on inter-regional travel for a pilot period of six months. We also agreed to consider proposals to create a regional travel bubble for a pilot period of six months, taking account of previous lessons learned. We endorsed the recommendation for further consultations in the development of a harmonized policy for ships for both vaccinated and unvaccinated persons. In this regard, heads of government mandated the CARICOM Secretariat in collaboration with CAFO and other relevant regional security agencies to convene a high-level meeting with cruise lines to agree on the minimum health and safety requirements for the resumption of cruise sailing in the Caribbean region. So the parameters have not been um, fully established. Uh, they will be a meeting, uh, I believe, next week uh, by um, heads to make final determination on the parameters of the um, travel bubble. We will have um, expert input from the Caribbean Development Bank. We, first of all, uh, in terms of um, encouraging um, increased uh, regional travel and to help the um, regional tourism sector to rebound, uh, we believe that we, and in fact, it's a commitment uh, to reduce um, regional taxes or to give consideration to reducing um, regional travel taxes in order to reduce the price of, um, of, of tickets and to increase the demand for travel. The Ministry of Agriculture on Wednesday signed another $340 million of contracts for countrywide drainage works and for the purchasing of tractors and other critical tilling equipment for the Ghana Sugar Cooperation. At the Ministry's head office at Shevchanda Paul Drive, the Agriculture Minister Zulfikar Mustafa took the opportunity to implore upon the contractors to ensure that they deliver quality work to the communities. According to Minister Mustafa, technical officers and engineers from the Agriculture Ministry will be deployed across the country to inspect works to ensure the government gets its money's worth. We have contracts or projects for places in Region 8 where we'll, where we'll be doing irrigation work so that farmers in those areas can receive, also receive benefit from the budgetary allocations that we have been making over time. Also, there are some critical work to be done in certain areas that were flooded out recently. Um, last month, when I visited Region 2, Pomeroon, with His Excellency the President, he committed that we'll be doing some empolderment there so that we can avoid future flooding in terms of people's farmland being flooded out. And I'm very happy that from last month to now we have had that contract. Um, that contract will be signing today to empolder a number of um, farming community in the Dredge Creek, Upper Pomeroon Region 2 area. And we have close to about $50 million in contract that will be done to do work there. Also, we'll be seeing rehabilitation of DNI structure in the Cane Grove area. You know, Cane Grove is a, also an important farming community. And we have made commitment there. And we have had representation from people in that community that they need some DNI structure and rehabilitation of irrigation channels and that, those contracts will be signed here this afternoon. 
Guyana's natural resource minister Vikram Bharat is urging quarry miners to significantly increase their production of building materials as the local demand is set to expand in the next two years. Here is Shakima Day with details. At a quarrying seminar hosted by the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission to encourage the efficient management of aggregate resources, Minister of Natural Resources Vikram Bharat called on licensed miners to ramp up their production in efforts to meet the growing demand. Minister Bharat said that Guyana for the past five years has imported over 200 tons of aggregates per year, although the country has enough of the resource at hand. And with Guyana's economy expanding rapidly with the advent of the petroleum sector, the demand for building materials is expected to shoot up to some 1.5 million tons, the minister explained. He added that the onus is now on the quarry miners to boost production in the sector to meet the demand. We recognize that there is a significant shortfall. We recognize that we need to boost the production in this sector. And we would have called upon the, I think it's eight quarry operators, existing license, when we took over to boost their production, to recapitalize, and to ensure that we reach the local demand. Minister Barrett added that a total of five new quarry licenses have been issued to further boost production. He encouraged the miners not to see themselves as competitors, but partners, as it will give them an edge over international companies who are flocking to the country to take advantage of the many opportunities being presented. The market is big enough for everyone. And that is something we need to see ourselves as. In Guyana, among ourselves, we see, we look at each other all the time as competitors. Not a single moment we look at ourselves as partners in the development of our country. And that is what we need to do. We need to look at each other as partners and not necessarily competitors. Minister Barrett also recommitted to working in the best interest of miners and urged them to see the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission as their partner. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Shakima Day. When the news returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a look at what's happening in sport. We start things off with some bodybuilding news. Fidesh Sukram, the organizing secretary of the Ghana Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation, has indicated that financial support will be needed for the team he describes as one of the best ever that will attend the Central America and Caribbean Bodybuilding Championship. Akim Green reports. The CSC Bodybuilding Championships is scheduled for August 11th to the 16th in El Salvador. And according to Sukram, the high cost attached to travel means that both the athletes and the coach will need some assistance. It's very important because the pandemic is one. Um, it's very hard for for an athlete to, to gather his own finances and stuff like that because um, gyms have been closed and it's hard. most of the athletes are trainers. So corporate support will have to come on board and give us a, a big hand. Um, it's very expensive. A ticket, I think, is just about a thousand US. And then there's also accommodation and meals preparation and stuff like that. So it's very important. Sukram, who's also a coach, indicated that he strongly believes this team can bring home numerous gold medals. The athletes selected are former medalist Corwin Clark, Emerson Kamala Yannick Grimes, along with Rosano Fung, Roger Kalenda, Darius Ramsamy, Nicholas Albert, and Raul Green. Something that this team is capable of, I think everybody on this team is capable of meddling. And I think we might turn our back with the largest amount of gold that we ever had for bodybuilding at CAC with this team that we have now. This, this is the best team that we ever had going to represent Guyana, one of the best teams. Um, we had a recently added Mr. Raul Green which is going to do the Masters bodybuilding. Um, Corwin Clark, former gold medalist, Emerson Campbell, silver, and Mr. Darius Ramsamy, who was placed fourth. Uh, Ms. Rosanna Fong, Forrest Timer, and Nicholas Albert, Forrest Timer. Um, Rosanna Fong is the best uh, bikini athlete that we had in Guyana, that we have in Guyana so far. Um, Nicholas Albert is the previous novice, reigning novice champion, 2019. Um, he have never had the opportunity of setting his foot on an overseas competition stage. But so far, it's the best team that we have had. 
The fitness coach said the restrictions imposed by the pandemic would have derailed the progress of many athletes. But he says they have been working hard in other areas. Some of the bodybuilders, it was a little bit difficult, but some of the bodybuilders um, use it to their advantage. Um, they use it to rest properly and take some more time to train, focus on meal preparations and stuff a little bit more. So it have its ups and downs. When Guyana last participated at the championships in 2019, Clark won gold in the under 167 pounds class and Grimes bronze in the men's physique. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Now, Cricket West Indies selection panel on Wednesday announced a 15-member squad to face Australia in the upcoming CG Insurance ODI series. The squad features most of the players who were part of the 3-0 clean sweep over Sri Lanka in the CG Insurance ODI series earlier this year. The Roger Harper-led panel gave recalls to experienced left-arm fast bowler Sheldon Cottrell, Guyanese batsman Shimron Hetmeyer, and all-rounder Rustin Chase. The CG Insurance ODI series will be played at Kensington Oval in Barbados on July 20, 22 and 24, with all three matches scheduled as day-night encounters starting 14 hours 30. There is great anticipation as this is Australia's first tour of the West Indies since the Tri-Nation series back in 2016. The series forms part of the International Cricket Council's ODI Super League, where both teams are aiming to win points to be one of the top seven teams that will secure automatic qualification to the 2023 ICC Cricket World Cup in India. The lead selector Roger Harper said, and I quote, This squad is coming off a comprehensive series win against Sri Lanka, which should boost their confidence going into what is expected to be a tougher contest against Australia. The return of Shimron Hetmeyer, Rustin Chase and Sheldon Cottrell adds greater depth and experience to the squad. Playing in familiar home conditions hopefully will bring out the best in each player, thereby enabling the team to perform at a consistently high standard. This CG Insurance ODI series against Australia is part of the ICC Cricket World Cup qualification process where every game and every point counts, so it is very important." End quote. The full squad reads Kieran Pollard captain, Shea Hope vice captain, Fabian Allen, Darren Bravo, Rustin Chase, Sheldon Cottrell, Shimron Hetmeyer, Jason Holder, Akil Hussein, Alzari Joseph, Evan Lewis, Jason Mohammed, Anderson Phillip, Nicholas Puran, and Romario Shepard. And West Indies batting all rounder Kyle Mears has signed for Birmingham Bears for the final three games of the Vitality Blast group stage. The left handed batsman and right arm medium bowler made his T20 international debut for West Indies away to New Zealand last year after impressing for Barbados Tridents in the 2020 Hero CPL with 222 runs. He subsequently won his first ODI cap versus Bangladesh at the beginning of the year and has made six test match appearances, which include scoring an unbeaten double hundred on his debut in February. The 28-year-old Myers will arrive in Edgbaston imminently and will be available for Friday's night's local derby away to Worcestershire Rapids in addition to the return match at Edgbaston one week later and the final group game at home to the Northern Steelbacks on July 18. Cricket fans in St. Lucia will uh, welcome the news that they will be able to see the World T20 Champions in action on the lights at the Darren Sami Cricket Stadium. Fully vaccinated patrons will again be allowed to attend the matches when defending T20 World Cup winners West Indies face Australia in a CG Insurance T20 series. The five-match series bowls off on Friday night, the first ball at 19 hours 30. In a similar move to earlier this international season in the Betway Test Series, the, Sri Lanka, the St. Lucia government along with the St. Lucia National Cricket Association and Cricket West Indies have come together to ensure a number of spectators will be in attendance. Provision has been made to initially accommodate 600 uh, fans per match, with 400 seated in the Johnson Charles stand and another 200 in the Castries stand. Fully vaccinated fans are those who have uh, received their second dose of COVID-19 vaccine two weeks before the match they will be attending. Still in cricket, 15-year-old Essequibo cricketer Rajendra Rambali wants to play at the highest level and his passion comes from an inclination to Australian batsman Steve Smith, currently the world's best test batsman. While Rambali is a left-hander, you will hear in this Akim Green report how the two may have a lot more in common than you think. Steve Smith. Yeah. Steve Smith. I like the way how he's um, 
common button and um, or is focus like the button style. When Steve Smith made his international debut in 2010, Rajendra Rambali was just four years of age, running around at his home in a Fiance Escribo course. Ten years later, he wants to be everything like Australia's Mark Utes batsman. There is a bit in common with the two. Both started their careers as leg spinners and are now frontline batsmen, but Rambali is a left-hander who is now finding his way. In 2020, when he was selected to the Guyana on the 15 squad, the tone was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, with the support of his father, Harris Chan Rambali, the opening batsman, has kept working on his craft. Uh, when I played the under 15 last year, the year before, um, I, I got to the trials and I made but enough runs. Uh, and since then, I started back. Dennis Joseph, a former senior scuba captain, is his coach and he feels a young man who is aspiring to be a mechanical engineer as well has some solid ingredients to play the sport at the highest level. First of all, the love for the game. And now these days, the youngster them doesn't have the, the love for the game. He has the love for the game. Patience. You have the patience in order to be batting long. And youngsters now these days, they, they just go and go out and the thing, but he bats long. For the, for the years I, I, I've been around, we have talent. We have talent. It's just to get, the, get them in a group and, and to work with them. We have talent. And just to get them and get them into a, an academy and, and, and get them to build them from there. Because our level is just a bit uh, part to, to the other two counties. One thing Rajinji is certain about is that he has to work hard to achieve his goals and this is something he's willing to do. Really hard because nothing easy don't come. So I gotta work hard for it. For the newsroom, Akin Green. And finally in sports, sprinter Shakiri Richardson will not run in the US Olympic 4x100 meter relay team after she accepted a one-month ban for testing positive for cannabis. The 21-year-old won the 100 meter at the US Olympic trials in Oregon in June and earlier this year ran the sixth fastest time in history. Supporters of the Texan had hoped she would take part in the relay in Tokyo as the ban expires on July 28. But US Aesthetics announced the full squad on Tuesday without Richardson. She said that she had used cannabis as a way of coping after the death of her biological mother. Richardson had already suggested she would not be competing at the Tokyo Olympics starting July 23. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avinash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.